And everything that we had running was provisioned by Shadow. Now we moved over to a much more, much simpler infrastructure. It, you can also uh, make it spin up an RDS database server for you when you start. So it's all pretty cool. Run, flipped uh, with Nginx, and it's it's done. So that's basically how uh, how we uh, went from Chef to Elastic Beanstalk by using a lot of services from AWS. And can we just start by getting a big round of applause for our first speaker, Tim Flapper? Um, so my talk is going to be about um, how we use Docker at Springist. So first I just want to quickly explain uh, what is Springist. Uh, Springist is a, a comparison site for education, anything, e-learning, um, uh, courses, uh, your regular courses, anything like that, schools. Um, which means that we have quite a, a big stack which revolves around searching and everything. Um, so our stack currently, like our, our technology stack currently is uh, Ruby on Rails 3, Psychics, Postgres, Memcache, uh, Redis, and Elasticsearch. So we have quite a, quite a couple of services that we're using. Uh, and we, uh, up until, I think, three months ago, we were uh, using a very complex infrastructure, using Chef for provisioning, uh, where everything was provisioned uh, Sorry, is it, is it too small? Uh, um, our app service, Postgres, Redis, Memp, everything that we had running was provisioned by Chef running on a rec space on our on virtual private service. Uh, and we were using Capistrano for deployments. Um, basically, in our company, it was one person that <coughs> knew um, how this all worked. And um, it was a big code base for Chef, and it was really kind of impossible for anybody to get into that. It was all kind of like, intuition based. So um, we decided this had, had to change. So um, now we moved over to a much more, much simpler infrastructure where we're using AWS CloudFormation for provisioning. Uh, we use Postgres uh, on RDS, Memcache and uh, Redis on Elastic Cache, and we use Elasticsearch. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, maybe I just should just like. <laughs> um, okay, so actually that isn't the whole situation because of course you can do a lot with cloud formation, um, but um, we need to get the software on our app servers, and that's the one thing that we don't do with cloud formation. We actually use Elastic Beanstalk by AWS. Um, so what is Elastic Beanstalk? Elastic Beanstalk is a system uh, provided by AWS and their console where you can quickly deploy uh, and manage applications in the AWS cloud without worrying about the infrastructure of running those applications. Um, it's basically just a little quote from their own website. Uh, and it's, it's true, this is basically what it offers. It's just a very simple, conf sim simple configurable uh, console where you can set up what you need and run it. Um, so there's three steps. You create an application, you create an environment, and you deploy your code. And you know, that's it, you're done. Um, currently you can run out of the box, you can run Go, Node.js, PHP, Python, Ruby, Tomcat, uh, ES, and Java, basically out of the box. Um, but of course, if that was it, then you know, it really wouldn't be any use for me giving this talk here. So there's one more option that's Docker, so that basically means that you can run anything you want on Elastic Beanstalk. So I just wanna give you a quick demo of how you uh, how this is set up. So I'm not going to show you how you create the environments, but kind of I'm going to show you how easy it is to deploy a little application. Show you kind of how how it works. So I'm going to just grab the chair here. So let's see. Where is my? Ah, there we are. Okay, is this? Big enough, I can zoom in a little. All right, um, actually, let me first show you. Oh, this is a little bit small. All right, so I set up, uh, I set up an Elastic Beanstalk application, especially for the Docker meetup. Um, so in, in an how, how it's called in Elastic Beanstalk is an application is a multitude of environments. For, for now, I just set up one environment, which is a Docker Meetup demo. Uh, so out of the box, it will give you a, a little CNA, like a little URL that you can use for a CNAME. 
uh, it'll give you health status. Um, you can see what ha what's happening with your environment. And as you can see here, it's running Docker. Um, it'll give you a, a lot of stuff to that you can configure. Currently, it's just a single instance, but you can change this to load balancing and auto scaling. And then you can set up how many instances you want to auto scale. You can you can decide you can um, configure what kind of instance type, uh, security groups, <coughs> your key pair for logging into the server, um, monitoring everything, uh, like how big the hard drive is. Um, you can even set up environment variables, so that makes it very easy to configure your uh, environment without having to redeploy it. You can just change the environment variable, disable something, change the data, which database server it's using, or anything like that. <coughs> um, and you can do and it, what. I really love about it is that it's doing uh, rolling updates for if you do a, a configuration update, um, uh, but also for deployments. If you have a, if you're running it on a load balancer, it'll take your server out of the load balancer, um, deploy the code to it, put it back into the load balancer. This is all managed by Elastic Beanstalk. So like with a couple of simple clicks and filling in some stuff, you get quite a lot of power. Um, so that's basically what you can configure on it. Um, it, you can also uh, make it spin up a, an RDS database server for you when you start. Um, so it's all pretty cool. At least that's I think so. Um, so what I what I deployed was a really really simple um, Rails application, um, which is basically nothing more than a controller and a, a little HTML file. Um, so let's just run. But it, let's just show what we have now. Oh, there we go. Should have opened this beforehand, of course. Um, okay, so this is basically just like, it's very simple. This is all, all it is. Um, so I'm just going to show you if I, if I change something here. We want to deploy this. It's a really simple one-line command. You basically, just do eb deploy. Oh, this is really hard with a microphone in your hand. Um, you just do eb deploy, and oh, of course, the one thing I forgot is that you have to add it to your Git um, repository. This isn't making it any easier. Uh, blah, I'm just not, don't want to type too much now. All right, there we go. So now it's committed, uh, and basically what it'll do is it'll take your it'll take your code from your last commit, and it'll deploy that. Like how it works, it it zips it and it sends it to the, it sends it to the server. Um, so basically now you can see what it's doing. You, you can you can abort this uh, if you don't want to if you want to do something else. It'll go on in the background because after it's kind of pushed the code to the server, it's kind of fire and forget. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so that's kind of what it what it does. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you what it really kind of runs on. So of course, it is running a Ruby on Rails application, but it isn't really running a Ruby on Rails application. Kind of like Elastic Beanstalk doesn't really know what it's running. It's just running a, a Docker file, and that Docker file has a has a, a port open, which is three thousand. You can see with the exposed three thousand, and there's an Nginx server running on the host machine, and that's linked to it. So. Basically, uh, this is the file that it's building on the server, with all the um, the files from the commit are also are pushed in the deploy, and it builds it on every server. It builds this Docker file, and then it runs it. Of course, if you have a Docker file with already code already in, you don't even need to send the code. You just send a Docker file. And one more, which I wanted to show, which is this Docker run AWS JSON, which is basically just a simple configuration file. There's a lot you can do with this. You can you, you can make it. Give it authentication for Quay. Um, give it like volumes to mount on the host machine. So like if you want to keep file, if you want to keep files between deploys, it'll you know you can store it there. Um, you can you can configure logging so that it stores your logging somewhere so you, so you don't lose that either. Um, and then there's all this other stuff in AWS, of course, like CloudWatch logs to make it really um, persistent. Um, so basically, really, what the only thing you would need is a Docker file and a Docker run that AWS adjacent. Which, yeah, if the Docker um, file itself has a from, like, has a base image that is um, that holds all your code, that's basically all it needs. Um, so let's see if it's done deploying now. 
and it's still going. Sometimes. Oh. Actually, yeah. So here you can see that you know you can you can follow it real time as well in the um, in the Elastic Beanstalk um, application. Yeah. All right, there it is. It's done. Uh, let me check. So basically, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Um, what I kind of want to show as well, but of course I forgot to set this up as well. Um, I, I kind of wanted to go into the server and kind of show you what's going on, but it's going to take me a while. So I'm just going to kind of explain to you kind of how Elastic Beanstalk does this. So what I said is it's a zip file which it sends to S3. Every uh, server, uh, the code on the server that's running, that's kind of like the Elastic Beanstalk base, downloads this and then runs a whole lot of stuff on it to make the, to build this Docker container. Um, run it, um, change the Nginx configuration, and it reloads Nginx and then runs it. Um, uh, let's see. So, oh yeah, actually, there's one thing that I can show, which is something that I really like because what Elastic Beanstalk offers as well is the ability to roll back a deploy if you made a mistake. Um, the, like you could, you could. Um, Automate this, like if you if you get a, a, a an event saying that the deploy failed for some reason, you can make it automatically roll back. But maybe you know the, the deploy went well, but there's a code failure or whatever. So what you can just do is you can just say here here's basically all the versions of the the code that have been deployed so far. You just click on the one previously. You do deploy to deploy, and it will just basically deploy that old version. So you have a, a log of all the old versions running on your on your uh, environment. So that's actually pretty nice. Let's go back in a minute to see if that worked. Um, all right. Um, so that's a demo. Um, there is another uh, option in Elastic Beanstalk, which is the worker tier. Which is, so that's not a, a web application, but that's actually um, for running um, cron jobs, uh, enqueued um, jobs using SQS. Uh, we're actually using it with sidekicks, that means that we're not using any of that. We're using the cron jobs, we're not using the, the <laughs> job queuing, we just basically do that ourselves, we're using Redis. Um, but there's actually quite a, a bit of power in there. Unfortunately, if you're using two of these environments, there's a little bit of manual configuration required. Um, we had an issue where, um, because we're deploying these two environments, we kind of want to do it speedy, so we kind of want to deploy them at the same time. We had an issue with, um, you know, where are you going to do your database migration? You know, we, we, we make database changes. You can do that in all your on all your servers and all your Docker files. But you know, if they're deploying at the same time, you really don't want to get into kind of weird transaction issues. So what we what we did was um, we made sure that our work environment, which is two two, base, two um, servers, uh, they handle the database migration. One of them is always the leader. That's how Elastic Beanstalk works. If you deploy to an environment, there's one leader server that kind of goes first and it does a lot of stuff. So that deploys first, and all the other servers on the other environment, they wait until that is done. So they're in their deploy um, flow, in their deploy configuration, but they're, they just kind of wait there and kind of, you know, have a little loop saying like, okay, has it been deployed yet? Like, has it been migrated yet? Has it been migrated yet? Uh, so when that happens, when the, um, when the working environment is done, the migration is, is good, then all the other servers go right after. Um, and of course, then you can have a situation where maybe the migration fail and it'll never migrate. So we build a little thing with Redis where it kind of sets a little message, and then if it um, um, if that if that key is there, then we know that it failed, and then the whole web environment will kind of roll back. Um, so this is kind of you know the basics of like what you can do with Elastic Beanstalk. Um, for us, where the real power came is when we started looking at, into our um, uh, continuous integration uh, platform, like the continuous integration we're using, the build, the, you know, running our tests and stuff. Or we um, found out that if we use um, workers, uh, Woo! Woo! there you go, <laughs> workers uh, Docker um, environment, their Docker infrastructure, that we could do a lot of stuff that we do for our tests and never have to do them again. So basically we have a base image which has all our dependencies, um, for um, everything we need to install in Ubuntu, so all the, the software that we need to install. Um, um, 
And then before our test, like because we were running Rails and Ruby, we we have a bundle like a gem file. We run a bundle install, which basically gets all our um, Ruby dependencies. Some some have, have are compiled. Some are just you know Ruby code. So that means that it has to be on the same platform. You know, this this stuff is compiled. You really don't want to kind of mess around with um, uh, with you know maybe you know if it's a different Ubuntu version, it might work. It might not. So we we want to do that in the same Docker uh, image. Um, so that's what we do. Like we run our, um, we make sure that we can everything is set up for running our tests. Uh, we run our tests, and when that's okay, then it's basically ready to deploy. Um, so if we deploy, um, there, we also do this with with uh, Worker. So Worker has a little deploy pipeline, which basically does our asset pre-compilation. It still has all the files from the from the build, of course. So the all those gen dependencies are still there. Uh, and then it basically does what I just did. So it just does this one command to pre-compile all, all our assets, pushes it to S3, so that's, okay, that's on our S uh, CDN. Uh, and then it just deploys, because it has all the files, you know, the, um, the whole bundle is there. So we don't need to ever do that again. So kind of every something that we do in every test, of course we have some caching, so it, we don't really do it every test, but you know, it changes. Um, that uh, happens on the server, like that happens on worker and never again. So that means that our deploy uh, cycle on the servers themselves is really fast. And also with auto scaling, pushing a new server basically just takes the same data and just builds a really, like it has to do two steps in a, in a Docker file, I mean a Docker file to build and that's it. Um, so that's it, like what we do, worker kind of gives us all these steps beforehand on their platform. Um, where the only things that we still have to do with kind of building a Docker image on the server, sorry, is um, putting in the files, and that's it, nothing more. So we just add in the files that were copied in that zip file, and then it's it's uh, and then it's um, run, flipped uh, with nginx, and it's it's done. Of course, you could do this, you know, differently. You could make worker make the Create an entire image and then push that somewhere, so you don't. You only have to download the image. Uh, but we actually noticed um, that if you have to continuously download a new image, of course, that might actually because there are changes that might actually be slower than just sending the files and the letting. Unless it means to do that last little step for it, for itself. Um, at least it doesn't really matter that much on speed. Um, <coughs> so that's basically how uh, how we uh, went from Chef to Elastic Beanstalk by using. Um, a lot of services from AWS that are managed, and then this little gem of a system to make our whole um, application server environment really simple to maintain. So in the end, profit. Um, so are there any questions? Uh, how do you deploy your sidekick workers? Um, your application workers? It's basically the same thing. So. Um, Sidekicks is uh, sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, so the question was, how do we deploy our worker environment, right? Our Sidekicks worker environment. So what I showed, like you have this with the web tier and the worker tier. We use the worker tier, which means that the configuration of like our SPS environment is a little bit different, but basically it's the same code base. It's just you know it's running a different application inside the code base. Um, so that means that it's basically pushing 99% of the same application to to environments, so do we deploy twice? You don't have to wait for the deploy, you can just go deploy one and then deploy the other one straight after. Um, and so that's basically how, how it works. The only difference is that you know you, you don't need Nginx because it's not an it's not a web application, so you, like, it, it makes it a lot, yeah, that environment's a lot simpler. It's really you know set up with um, environment variables to run sidekicks and not um, a lot of Puma threads. Does that answer your question? Uh, a little bit. So we have a separate config for the bin start for the workers? No, it's actually it's the same configuration. The only difference is the, the files we push to it are like we, we kind of there are some nginx configuration files and stuff that we uh, don't push to it. So it it kind of it runs slightly differently, but it's the same Docker image that's run on that machine. So it, all the files are basically the same. Any other question? Yeah, is there another way to manage your uh, environment variables besides the Yeah, you can use uh, the CLI of course. Hmm? Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, is there, sorry. Is there another way of um, 
the question was, is there another way of managing your environment variables than going into the web console? Yes, you can use, um, th there is a, um, you can use the, uh, the API, the S3, uh, sorry, the AWS API with the SDKs, any one you want, but you can also use the Elastic Beanstalk CLI, there's so like you have the AWS CLI, of course, but there is also one specific for Elastic Beanstalk, the one that I just used, and you can use that to get your environment variables, set them, so you can use that, and there is a, a third way, which is um, the entire configuration can be outputted as a config file, which is a YAML file, where everything that you can set up there, plus a little bit more, uh, can be configured, including your environment variables. So actually, when I set up the, a new environment, the completely new environment for like blue-green deployments or something, I have this file and all the environment variables are already in there, and we can change them before we actually set up the environment. So this is actually, like, we don't do it because it's kind of like we, we haven't really had the time and we don't really like the, the amount of time it takes for deploys. But it is a really good system if you want to do blue-green deployments. So if you want to kind of, you know, make, make a new environment, kind of set it up as a staging or something, and then check it out, and then you just flip it, because you can swap environments. Um, so I'll just go to the console. So here, actually, no. Actually, yes. So here, there is a, an option to swap environment URLs which means that you know the CNAM URL you have there, if you use that in, in your DNS, and you just swap them, another environment will get that URL, and, um, the, and, the, and this environment will get the, the one from the other one, so you swap them, and then within several seconds, if your DNS is quick enough, um, the new environment should be active. <coughs> so that's a really good way, and there's actually a lot of, there's actually a lot of code that, um, that's set up to do this, so you can really <coughs> manage your applications by that, that way. You know, make deploys that you know you, you're 100 percent sure, certain that everything's working if you want that. But for us, this was already good enough. Um, any other questions? <coughs> yeah, thanks for the talk. First off, really right. nice to see what's possible with the Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, I've been using Tutum uh, myself for a while, uh, not really looking at uh, Beanstalk, but I'm wondering what the differences are. Do you know? No, I'm sorry, I've never used that before. Okay, okay. because I see a lot of uh, uh, similarities. The only difference that I see at the moment is that Tutum uh, is able to work with and AWS and, well, name it and it can work with uh, anything you want. Okay, cool. I'm actually, I'm going to look into that. Okay. Actually, we, we tried days before we went to Elastic Beanstalk, but we tried it at, oh, yeah. at, a, at a point where their, um, their version was so unstable that we immediately went off it. and. Yeah. After uh, when we actually kind of had this just finished, we had a talk with the guys from Days, and we decided, and they were kind of like saying, "Oh, try us again because it's stable now." Um, I mean, now we now I'm kind of a little bit sad that we didn't, but uh, it's still this is I, I still love this system. It's so easy to use. I can understand. So. It. Yeah. Another random question on if you've tried something, have you looked at Amazon Container Service? Uh, yes, I've I've looked into it. Like you know, I think it's great to try that out. But unfortunately, we're on the Frankfurt uh, region for uh, AWS, and they don't um, they haven't kind of it's not there yet. So we can't use it yet. Else, I would have tried that out as well. Um, and also, actually, you can see that uh, in the stacks we're using, uh, everything is managed except our Elasticsearch stack, and that was just also moved to Frankfurt. So we could move to that, but of course, we're not as fast as they are with offering it, we still have to kind of try it out. But yeah, if once it's available in Frankfurt, I'm going to definitely try it out. I would like to do that, yeah. Um, you mean uh, for the Docker file, for your Docker file? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can basically, if you um, uh, set it up in that in that, comp, in that uh, Docker run at AWS adjacent, sorry, I'm going to repeat the question. Can you use a, a private registry for your Docker image, you can. So basically, uh, we, we're using Quay because we just noticed when we were trying it out the Docker Hub, it was a little bit unstable. Um, but you can do that, and then in the setup of that Docker run at AWS at JSON, which basically says which file it has to, to use, you can you can say, okay, this is um, the image. That, this is the image that you need. And this is the registry. So yeah, you can do you can do all, and of course in your front as well, like how you would usually do that. It should work. Yeah. Any other questions? 
right. Thank you very much.